Hi, and welcome to another video in fluid mechanics. Last time, we started exploring enclosed flows, a special set of flows surrounded by boundaries that could become fully developed. This included channel flows, which were driven by pressure difference, gravity force, or viscosity. Today, we'll be continuing our analysis of enclosed flows by exploring pressure-driven pipe flow. With this flow, we get to experience cylindrical coordinates for the first time, and we will solve it all the way through the conservation of mass and all three momentum equations. Let's jump in. Recall our procedure for solving the conservation equations, which we followed step by step for channel flow. First, we set up our flow by drawing a diagram and labeling all the boundaries, the flow, and coordinate system location. Second, we identified the boundary conditions. For channel flow, these were the no slip and no penetration conditions at the wall, meaning velocity in all three components was zero. Next, we applied our typical assumptions, steady, fully developed, two-dimensional, two-component, and incompressible. We'll make use of similar assumptions today in pipe flow. Then we simplified our equations with the assumptions. The first equation you work with is conservation of mass, which usually lets you solve for one of the velocity components. After was the conservation of momentum in the x-direction, which gave us the other velocity. In order to solve for the velocity functions, we needed to apply our boundary conditions to the equations. Last time for channel flow, we only used conservation of mass and momentum in the x-direction to get the velocity field. Today, we'll do the same but then explore the conservation momentum in the other two directions to learn more about the pressure field itself. Now we can get started with solving pipe flow, a round, enclosed flow in one of the most common flows on the planet. Pipe flow is actually symmetric about a center line. Our coordinate system is cylindrical, centered about the pipe center line axis. We have a flow from left to right driven by a pressure gradient. We know there's no body force because the pipe is level in this case, and there are no moving walls to drive viscosity-driven flow. The pipe radius is capital R, and the lowercase r coordinate is zero at the center line and capital R at the wall. We begin our analysis by gathering our assumptions. First, assume the flow is incompressible. Maybe the fluid is a liquid or a slow-moving gas. Next, we assume steady, not changing in time, fully developed so the flow isn't changing in the x direction, and two-dimensional two-component, meaning the flow doesn't change in the third dimension, which is theta for cylindrical coordinates, and u theta is zero. These three assumptions are contingent on the flow being laminar, which this pipe flow is. Note for pipes, the 2D condition is called axisymmetric, meaning nothing changes in the azimuthal, or theta direction. We also assume that there is no body force because our pipe is not angled. Now we consider our boundary conditions. As we did last time with channel flow, we assume the flow has a no-slip condition, meaning the velocity parallel to the wall is zero at the walls. And we also assume the no penetration condition, no perpendicular velocity at those walls. However, we have a difference. Here, because the flow revolves around an axis, we only have a condition at the wall, but nothing in the center line. We need a clear boundary condition for when the r coordinate equals zero, the pipe center line. To get that additional boundary condition, let's make the fairly obvious claim that we don't think the fluid velocity reaches infinity at any point. If the flow went to infinity, we would have a ton of problems. Let's begin solving the conservation of mass to get an expression for u sub r. Here, as we've seen a couple of times now, two terms go away because of the fully developed and axisymmetric condition. Note here that this is our first time using the equations in cylindrical coordinates, so take mental notes of what's different between Cartesian and cylindrical systems. That leaves us with an expression with the radial derivative of the product of r u r equals zero. Integrate this to give us that r u sub r is equal to some constant c1. 
This constant is zero because of the boundary condition that u sub r must be zero at the wall. And if it is zero in one spot, then it, a constant has to be zero everywhere. We find that throughout the entire flow field, the in-plane radial velocity is zero. Recall that we had a very similar result for channel flow with the y velocity. Next, onto the conservation of momentum in the streamwise direction. Let's write it all out this one time for practice. Most of the terms go away due to our assumptions. Steady, fully developed, 2D and 2C, and no body force. Also, we can remove a term because we just learned that the conservation of mass means u sub r is zero. We come to an expression with the viscous term on the left and the pressure gradient on the right. As with channel flow, pressure-driven pipe flow is a balance of viscous and pressure forces. Reorganize this, putting an r and mu on the right-hand side. Integrate once to get our first constant of integration, move the r over to the right-hand side, and then integrate again. Note here that the constant C2 gets a 1 over r in front of it when the r moves over to the right-hand side, and the integral of 1 over r is the natural log of r. After our second integration, we get an expression for velocity with two unknown constants. Here, we can make use of our super obvious boundary condition that the velocity cannot go to infinity. If we inspect our expression for ux, we notice that if r goes to zero, the term with c2 blows up to infinity. So we must conclude that c2 is zero. It is the only way to prevent the equation from exploding. Second, we apply the no-slip condition at the wall, which gives us our expression for c3, where little r equals big R. Plug these two constants back into the original expression for u sub x and reorganize to get its final form. At this point, we know all of the velocity components as functions. u sub x is here, u sub r is zero from conservation of mass, and u sub theta is zero from an assumption. This is where we stopped with channel flow, solving only for the velocity field, but it's reasonable to wonder why we don't explore the pressure further. The pressure gradient shows up in the velocity equations. Can we learn more about it? We can, and the way we learn about it is by looking at the other momentum equations. Starting with the R momentum equation, we can write it down with the assumptions already applied and the knowledge that UR is zero from conservation of mass. This tells us that the pressure gradient in the radial direction is zero. This means that pressure is not a function of R. And if we officially integrate it, we can say that pressure must be a function of x and theta, the other two variables in the system. Note that when we integrate, the constants of integration can be functions of other variables in the problem. It merely means it is constant with respect to the variable that you use for integration. Similarly, the theta momentum equation merely tells us that dp d theta is zero. Integrating this tells us that p must be a function of only x and r. If we combine the two expressions for pressure, one from the r momentum and one from the theta momentum, we can conclude that the pressure must only be a function of x, the streamwise direction. This might seem small because the function of x is still unknown, but has rather important practical implications. First, it tells us that you only need a single pressure measurement at any given x location of interest because pressure is constant in the plane crossing the flow. As a result, we only need a few measurements to eventually get the dp dx term that we need for the velocity field. So, if you have a pipe and you want to say something about the velocity inside, you need pressure measurements along the x direction. With the condition that pressure is only a function of x, we can make our pressure measurements at the wall, where it's easy to do and doesn't disrupt the flow, as opposed to making pressure measurements somewhere in the bulk pipe flow. This makes industrial pipe analysis and experimentation a whole lot easier. 
To summarize, solving our conservation equations for pipe flow told us that u theta was zero as we assumed, u sub r was zero because of the conservation of mass, and we got a detailed expression for the streamlined velocity from the x momentum as a function of the pressure gradient. Further solving the other momentum equations got us a more detailed understanding of the pressure. And that's it for pipe flow. Let's review. We started by recalling our step-by-step -step process for solving the conservation equations to the best of our ability. We applied these steps to pipe flow in axisymmetric and closed flow using cylindrical coordinates. With our assumptions and boundary conditions, conservation of mass and conservation of momentum got us detailed expressions for the velocity field. And moving on to the conservation of momentum in the other two directions, we learned about the pressure, which has practical measurement implications. It should be noted that these velocity functions only apply to laminar flow. As flow becomes turbulent, it gets a lot messier, which we'll see in later videos. I hope you enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching.